Tonight we're going to turn our attention to Bible prophecy and I want to speak to you on the subject of what is holding back the arrival of the Antichrist. I'm oftentimes asked the question, the questions and comments that come in by the thousands every week. Many times people that are new students of the Bible get stumped when they get into the New Testament and they read that passage that we're about to read where it deals with the restrainer. Let's read it. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 beginning to read at verse 1. Reading down through verse 12, reading out of the New Living Translation, written by the Apostle Paul, he said, Now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered to meet him. Pause right there. We live in a day and an age in which many main leading theologians, ministers, denominational leaders are minimizing Bible prophecy. I actually heard one major denominational leader not too long ago say, we really should stay away from Bible prophecy because it confuses new believers. And gave that as an excuse as to why he rarely, if ever, preaches or teaches on Bible prophecy. I remember hearing him say that and I thought, I wonder if he's ever studied the New Testament because the church at Thessalonica is a brand new infant church. They're just a few weeks, perhaps a few months old, and Paul writes two letters to that brand new infant church, both of which are totally encompassed in teaching and clarifying end time theology and Bible prophecy. Paul didn't think that Bible prophecy was too difficult for new believers. He thought it to be foundational for new believers. He thought it to be of vast importance to the foundation of a church that would thrive. And he's helping these brothers and sisters. He said, let's clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered to meet him. Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them, even if they claim to have a spiritual vision, a revelation, or a letter supposedly from us. If Paul wrote that an hour ago, it would be some of the best advice I could give you in listening to ministers on social media. Don't believe them even if they claim to have a spiritual vision, a revelation, or a letter supposedly from us. Don't be fooled by what they say. Everything answers to this Bible. Everything answers to the Word of God. And when you hear, and you will hear, eventually if you have not, hear individuals say something like, I know the Bible said, but... The Lord has given me a revelation on this that you may not have ever heard before. That's how you know you're about to hear from a false prophet. Because the Word of God never falters. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my Word will never pass away. There is no Word, no revelation, no thing given to men that's new that is better or bigger or more important than the priority and the integrity of the Holy Bible. Can I hear a great Alaska amen? amen? Don't be fooled by what they say, for that day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man of lawlessness refers to the Antichrist, the one who brings destruction. He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God claiming that he himself is God. Don't you remember that I told you about all of this when I was with you? Pause again. All of these individuals who are preaching and teaching that we are already living in the tribulation. And there are many. It's gaining traction in many circles. 
We're in the beginning of the tribulation. Theologically, they've missed it by a million miles. The Bible said that that day won't come until the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, is sitting in the temple, referring to the third temple in Jerusalem that does not exist. We can't be in the tribulation until there is the building of the third temple. We may or may not see the erection of the third temple until after the rapture. I've done a lot of research on it and I don't have time to get into it, but I've been told that the temple is totally built. Everything is cut. Everything is ready for assembly. I've been told they could put it together somewhere between 12 and 16 months. And the leading rabbi in Jerusalem not long ago said, while the third temple will be erected, we can erect the tabernacle of Moses in a matter of hours. And we can fulfill our covenants in the tabernacle of Moses while they're building the temple. But the Bible tells me three and a half years into the tribulation, the Antichrist is going to break his treaty with the nation of Israel and he is going to sit in the Holy of Holies. The Bible calls it the abomination of desolation. And when he breaks his peace treaty with Israel, then the wrath of God is going to be turned up to such a level that Jesus said, if God the Father had not shortened that time, the last three and a half years of the tribulation, if God did not shorten that time, none would survive. As it is, over half the earth's population is going to be totally wiped out during the tribulation. That's over four billion people on the trajectory of populace that we currently are on. Go to verse 6. And you know what is holding him back. Here it is. I like that. You know what is holding him back. Something's holding back the Antichrist. Paul knew it then. For he can be revealed only when his time comes. For this lawlessness is already at work secretly, but it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. Pause again. Again, I don't have time for this in depth, but this is important. Don't miss it. Listen carefully. Somebody asked me the question, why does the Bible in some passages talk about the Antichrist singular, but in other passages it talks about the Antichrists plural? Is that not a contradiction? Not when you understand who's in charge of the chronology of final Bible prophecy. The devil has no power in the timing of Bible prophecy, none. Matthew 24, 36, no man knows the day nor the hour that the Son of Man will return. No, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. God the Father has already charted a divine undisturbed course for all final prophetic events and the devil has no ability to accelerate it and the devil has no ability to decelerate it. God the Father is in charge. Jesus said, my Father only. And since Satan is in charge of the unholy trinity of final Bible prophecy. The unholy trinity is revealed for the very first time in Revelation 13, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, which is Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. That's the unholy trinity. It is a mockery and an imitation of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. But the Bible tells us that Satan is being restrained. The Antichrist is being restrained. The false prophet is being restrained. And so the devil, not knowing the timing of final Bible prophecy, has always had to have had an Antichrist waiting in the wings. Because the Antichrist is simply going to be puppeted, literally, demonically puppeted by Lucifer himself. Just like some politicians today. 
They're there, but they're being puppeted from behind the scenes. Thank you for all those amens. That's why they take the offering first around here. And Satan, not knowing the chronology of when God is going to do what he is going to do, has always had to have had an antichrist waiting in the wings. And that answers the question is why in some passages the Bible refers to antichrists, plural, and the antichrist, singular. After the rapture, that man that will be revealed will be the antichrist. Verse 7, this lawlessness is already at work secretly, but it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed, but the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. That's how the tribulation is going to end. The tribulation is exactly seven years long. When you get an opportunity on our YouTube channel, listen to my teaching on the 70 weeks of Daniel. Very, very important. You need to understand that vision. Daniel gave two visions in his book, one of which is the vision of 70 weeks. 69 of those weeks have already taken place. Those 69 weeks are sets of seven and seven years, not seven days. The 70th week, the 70th set of seven is the tribulation. Seven years in length and not by our calendar, but by the Hebraic calendar of 360 days. We know the exact day that the tribulation begins. Daniel 11 tells us the very moment that the Antichrist signs the peace treaty in Jerusalem. I believe the eyes of the world and the networks of the world will have it available for the world to see and it will become viral within an hour or less. That's the very day that the tribulation begins, the day that the peace treaty with Israel is signed by this new one world leader. Again, as I've taught all week, Revelation 13 tells us the five political agendas of the last days. A one world leader, a one world government, a one world monetary system, a one world religion, and a one world military power to enforce it. Young people, when you get a chance, Google one world temple. They just built the first one world religion temple in the Middle East, and it's magnificent. It'll almost put the hair on the back of your neck up because it literally looks like a building you'd see in heaven itself. And they have established the foundation for a one world religion. It was endorsed by the hierarchy of Islam. It was endorsed by the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. It was endorsed by the leading rabbis of Israel and Judaism. It was endorsed by many evangelical leaders. It exists as a testimony for the first time in the history of humanity. A glorious temple for a one world religion. The Bible prophesied that in AD 95. We are watching the final pieces of the stage being set for the arrival of the Antichrist, for the arrival of these five political agendas, but the rapture is going to take place first. I ask you tonight, if we are this close to the arrival of the Antichrist, how much closer are we to the rapture of the church? We should be living every day ready to meet the Lord. We should be living every day loaded for bear, literally when it comes to the kingdom of God wake up every day and say God what can I do to populate heaven and to plunder hell if you believe it and receive it give the Lord a mighty shout of praise
Verse 9, this man will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. He will use every kind of evil deception. Pause right there. If you're going to be a serious student of eschatology, Bible prophecy, and end time events, when you read the New Testament, keep your eyes open for the word deceive, deceived, and deception. Those three words, keep your eyes open when you read the Bible and especially the prophetic passages. And you will find that they are continuously salted and peppered with deceive, deceived, and deception. Verse 10, he will use every kind of evil deception to fool those on their way to destruction. Pause again. Deception always leads to destruction. That is why we are haunted with so many false teachers. Social media is a two-edged sword. There are many wonderful things that are accomplished by social media. To think that since I was here several months ago, that over 1.3 million people listened to a single message that I preached at Kings, Alaska in Wasilla is amazing. The potential to think that as I'm speaking here to this live audience, that in the days to come, a million plus people would hear the gospel preached from all around the world. That's a wonderful thing. But the flip side of that is the Bible said in the last days we would be overrun with false prophets. Little did we know that social media would become the fertilized garden of false prophets. And everybody that figured out how to go live is on there claiming to be a prophet or an apostle or have a word from God. And if there ever were a time that you needed the stability of the knowledge of the Bible and systematic theology and a man of God to walk you through you need it now more than you have ever needed it before how many of you have ever seen us on our YouTube channel and followed some of the Bible studies it's like that everywhere I go hands up and if you've watched you've heard me say many many times I would like to become a trusted voice in your life for understanding the Bible and navigating Bible prophecy. But that has to be earned. But I fear for many, not only in America, but around the world. Because if I'm honest with you, I would say that for every one man of God that's genuine or one woman of God that's genuine, there are 10,000 who shouldn't have gone on and put themselves in a place of being a teacher of the word. Thank you again for all those amens. You remember that, deception. Deception is the lead horse in the parade of the work of the Antichrist in the last days. Dare I say it, I think I will. Just because you figured out how to go on live doesn't mean you should have. Verse 11, so God will cause them to be greatly deceived. There it is again. And they will believe these lies. We just came through the first pandemic in all of world history that brought the entire globe to its knees. And if you didn't figure it out, you should figure it out by now. People in mass believed lies. Verse 12, then they will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. I'm always honest enough with our students around the world to tell them that there's open, vigorous debate on Bible prophecy and even some of the chronology of Bible prophecy. And there is debate on who the restraining power is, as mentioned in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 6 and 7. We know that the original manuscripts of the Bible were not written in English. 
The Old Testament was in Hebrew, New Testament in Greek, some manuscripts in Aramaic written over 1,500 years ago. The Word of God must be held to the integrity of the original manuscripts. And the word, keicho, restrainer, from the Greek, simply means to hold back or to restrain. Depending upon the translation of the Bible you're reading, it's translated in various ways. It's translated in the New Living Translation as the one who is holding it back. In the ESV and the NSAB, it is translated as the one who restrains. If you have an NIV, it is translated the one who holds back. If you have a King James Version, it is translated he who letteth. But in essence, they all are an accurate rendering from the original to hold back or to restrain. Who is this man of lawlessness that is being restrained? The scripture provides a vivid picture of the man of lawlessness. It says the one who brings destruction, the one who exalts himself as God, the one who desecrates the temple, the one who claims he is God, the man who comes to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power, signs, miracles, the man who uses every kind of evil deception to fool a massive group of humanity on their way to destruction. That man is none other and there is no debate as to who that is in notable circles of scholarship. It is speaking of the Antichrist. When will the Antichrist be revealed? The Antichrist, the Bible said, will remain hidden and can only be revealed until the restrainer or the one who is holding him back steps out of the way. Which brings us to the obvious if you're taking notes, who or what is the restrainer? Since the restrainer is holding back the promotion of the Antichrist, let me state the obvious. The restrainer obviously has greater power and greater authority. You can't restrain somebody who's stronger than you are. So the restrainer has greater power, greater authority. Since the restrainer steps out of the way, the restrainer must also be removable. Perhaps the greatest clue as to the understanding of who or what the restrainer is is found by a closer examination of the original language that this text was written in. The restrainer is referred to with both neuter and masculine Greek verbs. The phrase, what is holding him back, in verse 6, uses a neuter verb suggesting principle. The phrase, the one who is holding it back, in verse 7, uses a masculine verb suggesting a person. In the Greek, the word pneuma, translated as spirit in our English translation, is also neuter. However, the Holy Spirit is consistently referred to by masculine pronouns. Go to John 14, verses 15 through 17. If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit. He is the Holy Spirit, highlight he, who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be with you. If masculinity triggers you, you and the Holy Spirit are never going to get along. Because the Holy Spirit is not effeminate. The Holy Spirit is He. The Holy Spirit is Him. 
The Holy Spirit is power. The Holy Spirit is authority. The Holy Spirit is might. The Holy Spirit is muscle. The Holy Spirit is awesome. The Holy Spirit is glorious. And He came to dwell in me and on me and in you and on you and upon the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to hear that in modern preaching. In the 1940s and 50s, young men lied about their age so that they could be snuck into the draft to go to war. Men today lie about their sex so that they can play women's sports. We need a revival of he. We need a revival of him. We need a revival of masculinity. We need a revival of men that stand in the power and the authority of the pulpit with the word of God and the sword of the spirit unashamed. God give us a revival of men. If I haven't offended you yet, be patient. I'll get to you. 1 Corinthians 3.16, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? The Holy Spirit is the enduing, empowering force of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, which means that the corporate church in the world today is the most prolific force in the world. And the Holy Spirit uses both in word and in deed the church to restrain wickedness. Put your seat belts on. You probably aren't going to like what I'm about to say. Maybe it'll bless some of you. Blesses me. If you think the world is unrestrained now, this is the world, according to Bible prophecy, that's restrained. As crazy as the world is now. Somebody asked me, how many genders are there? Two. The Bible said he created them male and female. Say, well, that's being disrespectful to people that identify by other genders. You want to call yourself another gender? Knock yourself out. But don't expect me to believe your insanity. Amen. Don't force your insanity upon me. Amen. Let me remind you that I'm not the oddball. From the beginning of human history, throughout all civilizations, there has always been men and women. If you want to call yourself whatever, knock yourself out. If you want to call yourself a lampshade, I'm happy for you. Here's a light bulb. Shove it in the proper socket and turn it on. Thank you, Father, for delivering me in the nick of time. It doesn't offend me. You can call yourself anything you want to call yourself, but don't expect me to believe your insanity. Whatever you call yourself, you put a hundred men and a hundred women and a hundred of everything else on a remote island and come back in a hundred years and you're only going to find male and female DNA in the skeletons. Thank you for all those amens. Let's move on, shall we? Matthew 5 verses 13 through 16, you are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. 
No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. The church is the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And salt preserves and protects and light restrains darkness the moment it comes to bear. Now you understand why the Holy Spirit can be referred to from the original language both in neuter and masculine form. In summary, the restrainer is holding back the arrival of the Antichrist because as we've learned the restrainer has greater power greater authority and the restrainer is able to be removed I close with this one scholar wrote these words listen to them he wrote quote the rapture will change everything for when the rapture occurs the spirit indwelt church and its restraining influence will be removed. That will release the world to sin as it never has before. Christians who stand for civic righteousness and law and order will no longer be present exerting their influence. The church's salt and light will be extracted from the earth for a time at least only unsaved people will hold government office. Satan will be able to put his plan into full swing by bringing his man on the center stage to take control of the world. Then evil will erupt and expand unchecked beyond anything known in the history of man. It will be like the removal of a huge dam. The world will be inundated with evil of unimaginable scope and severity. End quote. I close with this. If the perverse, corrupted, wicked world that we are watching now is while the restrainer is present, imagine the level of hell and perversion and wickedness and murder. Unimaginable. No sermon could address it. The Bible says it'll be so wicked on earth that men's hearts will fail them for fear. Just drop dead. Things will be so severe. They just drop dead. Their hearts fail from what they're watching. And that isn't righteous people that are dropping dead because they're so shocked by the wickedness in the world. That's wicked people dropping dead because of the levels of wickedness unimagined. Don't miss this. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is the restraining power. You know, some nations won't even notice when the rapture takes place. You take a nation like Turkey, for example. Somewhere between 45, 50 million people in Turkey and just a small group of Christians. When the rapture takes place in Turkey, they'll hardly notice that anything happened. But a nation like America, with somewhere between conservatively 60 to 90 million believers, some surveys take that to 130 million, I'm giving you very conservative numbers. Imagine what will happen in America when in the twinkling of an eye, 60 to 90 million people are instantaneously snatched from this earth. That's why America is not in final Bible prophecy. Because America will implode immediately after the rapture and will become eminently vulnerable to the world. And we are hated in much of the world. 
There are world leaders who stand on the floors of the United Nations promising to wipe us off the face of the earth. But the rapture is going to wipe us off the face of the earth. You take 60 to 90 million people out of the American economy, our economy collapses in hours. You take 60 to 90 million people out of the workforce and our industry collapses within hours. You take 60 to 90 million out of the workforce and capitalism is instantaneously dead in the water. You take 60 to 90 million people out of this country. You talk about vandalism. You talk about insanity. You talk about greed. You talk about gathering the spoils of war. It will trigger a side of humanity when the restraining power of the church is gone. America will be like rabid dogs within hours. And it's coming. Furthermore, something haunts me in Bible prophecy, and I don't preach it dogmatically. But the Bible tells me that there will be nuclear wars. I believe, and I don't have time to preach it. If the Lord tarries when I come back, I'll talk to you about the final wars of Bible prophecy, because I believe there are several. I believe I could lay out a pretty strong case that there are a total of seven world wars. We've had two. I believe there's the ability to lay out the possibilities of five in the seven years of tribulation. But just lay that aside for a moment. We know that nuclear war is about to break out because crazed world dictators keep promising they're about to use it. Here's something you need to know about history. Just lay Bible prophecy aside and put the history book down for a second. Here's something about history. No nation has ever invented advanced military technology without eventually using it, ever. Sooner or later, they always use it. Now here's what haunts me from a biblical standpoint. The Bible guarantees this covenant. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reapeth. There is only one nation in the history of humanity that has sown nuclear bombs. And it's the United States of America. And many old-fashioned eschatology scholars dogmatically wrote, America has sown a date where nuclear war that it sowed will come back to haunt its own manland. I'm not saying it dogmatically, but I am saying there are many scholars that I would consider far above my level who say America has an inevitable date with nuclear war after the rapture. And one of the reasons why they're so strong on that is because there is no America in the final pages of Bible prophecy. There's 15 nations mentioned directly in final Bible prophecy. How do you explain the most dominant, powerful, wealthy, advanced nation on the face of the earth? Not a whisper of its existence after the rapture of the church. It's a message in and of itself for another time. But I believe strongly that the book indicates that this nation will implode within hours of the rapture. It cannot sustain even from an intellectual analysis the survival of 60 to 90 million people being taken. I close with this question. The rapture could take place tonight. Would you be taken or would you be left behind? You need to live every day ready to meet the Lord. Musicians, would you come and would you please stand with me all across this sanctuary? 
And as much as is possible, I'm going to ask you to hold steady. What we do now is the most important thing we do each night. And that is give people an opportunity to make peace with God. All of these young people that are here tonight, I am so happy you're here. I'm an older man now. But in my early ministry as an evangelist, I preached over 350 youth camps and youth conventions. In one night, I saw over 6,000 teenagers baptized in the Holy Ghost. And I'm an older man now, and I have younger associate evangelists. But I just want you to know that I still have a burden and a love for young people as much now as ever before. Can I just speak to you for a moment and ask you, do you have a clear, distinct memory of a time in your life when you've gotten down on bended knees in the presence of a holy God and repented of your sins and asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and your Savior? Because if you plan on making the rapture, you have to make your own personal and public commitment to Jesus Christ. In other words, your mom and dad might be devoutly saved people, but that doesn't make you a Christian. There has to come a time in your youth where you spiritually, mentally, and intellectually decide on your own, I want to be ready to meet the Lord. I don't want to be left behind. I don't want to ever experience a single hour of the tribulation period. And the way you do that is like tonight when I give the invitation. If you've never done that, I'm going to challenge you. I'd like to have the privilege of praying with you tonight. Some of you might have friends, people you work with, people you go to school with, neighbors, family. And they've never made that commitment to Christ. When I give the invitation, those of you that are saved, I want you to turn to your brother, your sister, your friend, and say, if you want to pray that prayer of commitment, I'll walk with you. And some of you can lead your friends to Christ tonight. And for the rest of the auditorium, I'm going to ask you to meet me at this altar in just a moment. By coming to this altar, listen, don't miss this, by coming to this altar, you're not doing this for me. You're not doing it for effect. You're doing it in consecration to God. By coming to this altar, you're saying, Father, I want to be ready for these last days. I want to live ready for the rapture of the church. I want to know that I know that I know that my sins are forgiven that I've been washed in the blood of Jesus, that my mind and my body and my spirit are clean and holy in your eyes. Some of you that will come and pray with me, it might be the very first time you've ever done this publicly and personally. But again, Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 8, he said, if you confess me publicly before men, I'll confess you openly before my Father which is in heaven. But if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father and the angels. Does it take faith and courage and humility to meet me at an altar? Of course it does. Listen, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to keep you. We're going to pray what many people call a sinner's prayer and talk to God. There are some of you that are doing it for the first time, but there are many of you. You need to come back home to the Lord. You've gone from right relationship with God to religiosity. You go to church, you read your Bible, you sing Christian songs, but you're not living in victory over sin. Sin's living in victory over you. And you need to come back to an altar and God will take you and God will forgive you and God will restore you. But post COVID, a lot of people went from being right with God to being religious but it's time to come home. I'm gonna kneel here and pray that God gives you the courage to do what you want to do. And I always ask those that have the courage, you be the very first ones to come. Your courage will help others. I remind you again, when the restrainer is removed, the world will implode. 
by coming to this altar, you're saying, I want to live ready to meet Christ. If you feel the tug of God, you come right now and then we'll pray before we're dismissed. Come on, Jesus is speaking to your heart. Tonight's your night. Summer's still coming. Sing that chorus one more time, brother. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Many of you are watching online. Only God knows how many thousands will watch this service in the days and weeks and months ahead. But if you're listening to me right now, through any type of platform, and you're not right with God, you need to pray with us as well. And when you're done praying, if you're anywhere in Alaska, I want you to go online and connect with Kings Alaska right here in Wasilla, but anywhere else in the world, I want you to go to lostlamb.org. That's our ministry. Lostlamb.org and click on New Beginnings. For all of you, those online, those that are at this altar. Praying a sinner's prayer is not the end of what God's going to do with your life. It's just the beginning. You not only have to be sincere in your prayer, you have to walk what you talk. But the Lord will help you and give you the strength. He'll fill you with the Holy Spirit and give you a power that you don't have on your own. Just remember, God will never ask you to do anything that he'll not give you the power to get it done. You can do this with the help of God, and this is where it begins. Everything begins at an altar of prayer and an altar of humility. Those of you that are here, those of you that are online, pray this with me out loud and without shame. Say, Heavenly Father, tonight as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. Down deep in my heart, I want to be a real Christian. I want to live ready for your soon coming. I want to know that I have peace with God. Tonight I admit my sin and I repent. In childlike faith, I turn my back on sin and I turn my heart to Jesus. I trust in your grace and in your mercy and in the cross and in the blood that was shed. Wash my mind, my body and my spirit Purify me and make me holy in your eyes. Tonight I receive salvation by faith in God. Come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. I vow this night I will serve the Lord all the days of my life. I cannot do that in my own strength. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me the power of God to be what you've created me to be. And now according to the promise of your own word, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Tonight I'm saved. I'm healed. I'm delivered. I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. I'm no longer the property of sin. I am tonight a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. 
I love you, Wasilla. I love you, family of God. Pray for me. I look forward to seeing you again in Jesus' name. Pastor.